the whole movie has a cycle to it. Uh, the beginning is establishing the main character with the camera focused on the main character and then the turning away of the camera. And then what I really wanted to do was just throw the camera off the top of the building. A 60 story building wouldn't have worked. I never would have recovered the film. You know, it's, it's impossible to do unless you have a, a machine that can you know, drop a camera 60 stories, which is very expensive. But I, I wanted to get the idea that uh, you're, you're diving off a precipice, you're diving with, with friends, with Tom Cruise, with Michael Jordan, Martin Luther King, popular icons. I wanted to give a sense of comfort and dismay to the audience. And I wanted them to feel that uh, there, there's, there's, a, there's, there's two basic images. One is an image of chaos, which is the spinning miasma of, of the bean. Uh, that if you've seen the bean downtown, you know that when you go underneath and you look up, there's this kind of swirling vortex. Like it's called cloud gate, and the idea is you're, you're supposed to look at it and see whatever. Um, so I, I wanted to establish that there, there's this kind of chaos in the vortex, but then that if you map the grid over that vortex, then suddenly there becomes order. And, you know, we've talked a lot about the therapeutic model, and my own feeling about the therapeutic model is that um, it, uh, it provides a sort of a grid for the, for the patient. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not a guarantee that the patient won't go off the grid or won't reject the grid. But uh, to me, the grid is uh, it's, a, it's, it's a, a mathematical certainty. And there's a great book by Hannah Higgins called The Grid Book, which I recommend. It was influential on me. Um, so I don't know. Was there any more comments or questions? I, my question was about the grid and how it's used in the movie, actually. So um, just the establishing beginning shots when you move the camera away, and there's like this sort of grid of the bars on the top of the uh, on top of the building. And mm -hmm. then there's that middle sequence where you stay fixed uh, above just a, a grid for a long time, and it pan out, and there's some white space around it. Did you see that like between that and sort of the final sort of vortex grid and the reflection of the beam, is that sort of a progression that you were thinking about or showing the space outside the grid is part of the thing that connects one to the other or was that way too literal of a way to No, that's look perfect at it? that's a perfect reading. My my feeling is that the grid is what uh, ultimately drives the forces of nature because we're confronted with this desire to give order to chaos. Uh, makes sense out of the nonsensical and uh, psychiatry as much as any other field is designed to control the the chaos within a person's mind. So, uh, in my own life, the grid has been the one thing that that it, you know really kept me alive, kept me going. I mean, uh, I had uh, numerous traumatic experiences growing up, trouble with gangs and drugs and uh, homelessness, poverty, and um, it wasn't until about 10 years ago when I finally made the commitment to medication and sobriety that I realized this grid had been the, the, the essential thing that it really had been driving. It, it had been driving a lot of my dreams and hopes. Um, and uh, my real question is, is the grid a grandiose idea? Can you explain what the grid is? I could, I could actually draw you a picture on the whiteboard. The Hannah Higgins, who wrote the grid books, and she and I had a conversation some weeks ago about the grid. And she said the problem with the grid is that it, uh, if, if you spend too much time on it, it will drive you insane. So long ago, I was driven insane by the grid. Probably when I was maybe eight, I started studying it. And what I realized was that in plane geometry, which I learned as a boy, you have uh, two axes, x and a y axis. Uh, on that way, that way, that way, and that way. And this is your area of positivity. This is your area of negativity. This is half negative and half positive, half negative and half positive. So my big problem was what happens right in the middle? What's the center like? What, is, that, is, that, is that a real place? Is it, is it some place we can visit? graph. 
And so what I decided to do was dive into that, into my madness, in the grid, and look for that space. And what I found was that if you, if you had a zoom lens and you zoomed into, you dove into the heart, the very center there of the grid, you'd find a square. And it gets back to one of the oldest questions in math, how do you square the circle? So I did it. I said, instead of having numbers go off in that direction, what if they went in a vortex and, and circled themselves? So I, I decided to have the numbers go that way, and the numbers go that way, and the numbers go that way, and the numbers go that way. And what I found was that if you plot one point, you give me a coordinate, say 3.14, you plot that there, that there, that there, and that there. And then you get another square. And if you go into the heart of that square, then you find the center. So I don't know if this is making any sense, but it all deals with numbers. Um, basic whole numbers that we all learned. And uh, just going around. In what way is this um, psychologically helpful? Well, it's for me, it's philosophical. Because it, 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 it tells me that there are simple answers to complicated questions. That uh, even a child can understand the most complicated things in a childlike way. And so I see this as a childlike way of solving a very ancient math problem, which has been vexing philosophers for, since the beginning of math. Um, I mean, you're talking about the globalization of mental illness. Yeah. There's a book that just came out called Crazy Like Us, right? Uh, I think it's the guy. Ian yeah. Waters. Yeah, he was on NPR. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you feel like your movie needs, we were talking earlier about how you felt that, or I was saying... Yeah, it needs a main character. This yeah, is, and, and, and then you said about. that you've gotten another response, which was there was no real story. Right. So do you feel that there needs to be one? Or? Well, I like it the way it is, but I, I'm, it's, not, it's not a finished project, let's put it that way. This is sort of, uh, what's the word, imprimatur, uh, an introduction, perhaps, a preface. A preamble uh, to, to a larger feature film, uh, which I hope to finish in the years to come. And I will use uh, the materials and notes from this class as uh, research materials. And um, I am entirely ensconced in this class. I'm digesting everything and um, uh, so it's a work in progress. Yeah, it, well, I mean, this was crazy talk that, as you saw today, is just an introduction to the larger project. Okay. Um, the larger project will have a main character and supporting characters and uh, reasonable voices and uh, <laughs> you know, okay. a sensible beginning, middle, and end. Okay. I guess I wanted to ask, um, maybe not what your stake is in that, but the central, the main character that we first see when we see your shot in the skylines are revolving around you and we come back to that the lonely thing at the end. I found that through the torrent of all of those um, those news clippings, I wasn't I began to feel like the character I began to feel overwhelmed and assume that perhaps the person holding the camera, the central character, must be overwhelmed and that he ends up in this vortex and yes. that all of those things are what place him there. But I felt at the same time that he sort of lost a sense of what his own definition of you you had to know right on that in fact I didn't know until you just said that right now, but that's what I was going through while I was making the film. Because I had been clipping these articles for months and months, and I just had stacks, I had a, 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 drawer, a stack of newspapers this high that I was sorting through and uh, getting myself artificial deadlines when I had to finish it by this date or I had to get this shot by this time or get this interview together. Um, so the articles became almost uh, a 50 yard or 100 yard dash where I was challenging myself to see how fast I could get them done. And after I finished it, I realized uh, that it was, it was uh, a mad dash to the finish line. And I, I looked at it, and I, I still watch it, and I said, God, 
are people going to be able to read all those articles? I've given them, I've given them 2.7 seconds to read 15 words. That's not fair. I know by the rules of documentary that that's not fair. <laughs> but I also know that part of what I'm trying to say is, of course it's not fair. If you get two words, I'd be surprised. Uh, it, it's, it's more just to establish a kind of tone. And my mother, I'd like to point out, helped with this project. She, she did the music. If you, if you notice the vocal, the vocal piece at the beginning and the end, with the, just the voices, uh, is a song called Mad Song. Uh, for chord, it's a choral arrangement, and the thing I like about it is it's kind of atonal, which is somewhat chaotic in and of itself. Uh, you know, I'm searching for a word that it, it kind of attacks the establishment of what music is, so what is thought to be beautiful music, and so on. Maybe perhaps with Crazy Talk, I'm trying to attack the establishment of what crazy, what what documentary is supposed to be. Crazy Talk is attacking the documentary, um, saying. Why, why do we need easy to read headlines that we can read and digest and then burp and say, ah, oh, wasn't that good? What if they come at us you know, faster than we can possibly consume? What does that do to us as viewers? Doesn't it make us a little crazy? And to get back to what you were talking about, the binary of the mad world or the sane world, I don't know. I don't know if the world is mad. I don't know if it's sane. 